Don't allow the lucid moment to dissolve. Let the radiant thought last in stillness, though the page is almost filled and the flame flickers. We haven't risen yet to the level of ourselves. Knowledge grows slowly like a wisdom tooth. The stature of a man is still notched high on a white door. From far off, the joyful voice of a trumpet and of a song rolled up like a cat. What passes doesn't fall into a void. The stoker is still feeding coal into the fire. Don't allow the lucid moment to dissolve on a hard, dry substance. You have to engrave the truth. Don't allow the lucid moment to dissolve a poem by Polish poet Adam Zagajewski. Good evening. Uh, my name is Charles Carr, and welcome to Philly Loves Poetry, a collaborative program between the Moonstone Arts Center of Philadelphia and Philly Kent. The focus of our program is to give our audience the experience of the rich culture of poetry in the city of Philadelphia. There are over 50 organizations in the city and the surrounding community that in some way or other promote the love of poetry in the city, either by offering poetry readings or special poetry events, as well as offering poetry workshops workshops for poets at all stages of the development, both for poets, what I say, on the stage and poets of the page. Also, there are lots of poets, poetry being published in the city of Philadelphia, Moonstone being a, a publisher of poetry books. Uh, there are a number of organizations that uh, publish uh, poetry journals in the city of Philadelphia. So on any given day or night in the city of Philadelphia, somewhere poetry is being performed. And even though we have the pandemic, there's still ways uh, virtually to watch and participate in uh, poetry events. So tonight we have a very special guest. We have the 2021 Philadelphia Poet Laureate, Trabita B. Mason. Trapita is a recipient of a Pew Fellowship in Literature, Leeway Transformation Award, Leeway Art and Change Grant, and the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts Grants. Trapita's work was also nominated for a 2016 Pushcart Prize. Trapita is a Cave Cameron and Callaloo Fellow and a 2019 Aspen Words Emerging Writers Fellow with the Aspen Institute. She is the author of She Was Once Herself and Mocha Melodies. Trapita also released two music and poetry projects, Scat, and this is how we get through, in collaboration with internationally acclaimed jazz guitarist, Monette Sudler. Trapita's other publications include submissions in the American Poetry Review, the Epiphany Literary Journal, the American Journal of Poetry, among others. Trapita is a native of Liberia. She is a graduate of Temple University, Bryn Mawr Graduate School of Social Research and Social Work and Villanova University School of Business. Currently working in the social services field, Trapita is a member of several local organizations where she uses the arts to mobilize, build community and create change. And if you wanted to contact uh, Trapita, she you can do so at her email address is trapetamason.com. That's T-R-A-P-E-T-A, M as Mary, A-Y-S-O-N.com. So welcome, Trapita. Thank you. Good to have you. And I would say congratulations on your nomination for this very prestigious role <laughs> and carrying, uh, you know, a very big responsibility in this community um, that is has a great culture of poetry in the city of Philadelphia, but I think you're a great candidate uh, to be able to push that mission forward. So uh, before I, I get into some other questions, I want to go back to the title of the poem that I read. It's mm -hmm. Don't Allow the Lucid Moment to Dissolve. And um, I don't know if our moment is uh, lucid enough, but there is a moment now in uh, America 
society and that moment of uh, change or opportunity for change in our whole approach and relationship to race. Mm. But my question then that I have, you know, and I know it's only been two and a half, maybe three months that we've had this momentum that has built and built. And whether you as an African-American woman, whether you as an African-American artist and poet and someone who is, you know, works in the community and really has an, op an opportunity to observe, whether you are seeing a, a change, a, a real movement, and that this is just not a passing episode in American history and American race relationships. So first of all, I want to thank you, Charles and uh, Philly Cam, uh, Larry Robbins, for inviting me and Moon soon to be a part of this this wonderful broadcast. Um, and I enjoy that poem you read, by the way. It was really, really special. Um, so to that question, um, you, you know, I kind of said this to someone not too long ago, that the change itself, it's the momentum, the action, the movement, all of this has been happening for many, many, many years. And um, I think right now there's an urgency, you know, sort of like when we talk about poems and we talk about stories and we talk about this urgency of um, the time and how important it is to get our voices out there. I don't, I don't think we're talking about change a lot. I think these things have always been happening. It's just reaching, a, 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 more people are paying attention. That's because the change makers, I say the change takers um, are forcing people to pay attention. So this momentum that you're feeling, I think it's just sort of like it's spreading uh, around a lot more, but it's always existed. There's been urgency in the struggle. Um, so as a African-American woman, an African woman, a woman, um, I think we have arrived at the time when there's, you can't, it's going to happen whether the powers that be want it or not. Um, they're going to have to just move out the way for the change. Mm -hmm. um, so I know you were saying, is it, is it something that's quick? Is it a flash in the pan? Is it going to go away? Um, the brutality won't go away. The violence won't go away. The, um, the uh, treatment of marginalized people won't go away. So as long as these things are still here, those uh, that urgency, the struggle, the fight, all of that's going to continue. Um, I can't say what it's going to look like in the end. I don't think there's a happy ending necessarily. What I do think is that there's that there 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 will be a, a fight for equity, a fight for justice, and I think that that's going to continue on. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't really thought about so much about the longevity of it. It's just because we're all so much entrenched in the struggle. So when you're mm -hmm. entrenched in it, you're fighting to thrive and to survive and less about, you know, it's going to work or, or mm -hmm. you know, how is it going to work? So, you know, having said that, and of course, we're kind of forced to be inside, even though, you know, there are protests mm -hmm. and, um, you know, there's still media. Yeah. How do you think this is uh, plays out uh, in terms of what we do, which is the poetry scene and the, be and, and the expression of that in our art form? And uh, is do you feel that it's even though we're, you know, kind of locked inside a little bit and we're we're, we're doing a lot of things virtually mm -hmm. um, that we're really seeing that seep out, you know, to a wider community? Yeah, I think I was talking to another poet about this recently. Um, you know, we're so we're confined, in, you know, literally in so many ways in, in, in our homes. And we've had to make adjustments. We've had to deal with being able to reach people. For me, it was it's, it's a little bit of a struggle um, as poet laureate and also as just a poet and a person who is very much real time about that those intimate moments with people, particularly sharing art, sharing poetry. So it's been a struggle, but then on the other hand, there's a wider reach, you know. Um, I've been in, on, in poetry readings where I'm actually engaging people from other cities and states and countries um, on, virtually, and that isn't something that we were able, easily able to do. 
I think the key word here is balance, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think that it really is about balance. Um, you still need to find a way to, to reach people, even in these spaces that just feel so cold, you know, even on this platform. And I think if you're bringing your authentic self, your authentic, your authentic truth and your story and people can relate to it, they're still going to feel that energy um, across these platforms. Um, I do sometimes I wonder about the individuals who don't have access or privilege to be able to 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 do that. And I think we we, we have to find a way and think about how we're reaching those people through our art. But the number one thing that we can do right now is to try to survive through this as individuals so that we can be of use to someone else um, through our poetry or whatever our art making is. Great. Well, Trapita also, I mean, you're a poet. And as I said, I read in your biography, you've also been very active uh, professionally in the community, mm -hmm. both as a clinical social worker, as a uh, social service administrator. Mm -hmm. And so you're very close to, you know, what you would indicate the marginalized people, um, people that are, mm -hmm. are immigrants, people that maybe are suffering you know, as a result of, you know, what is happening with the virus, suffering, you know, emotionally suffering, financially. Yes. Uh, what's your perspective on what you, can you share, you know, from where you're sitting each day? Mm. Ooh, what I can share is compassion and gratitude. Um, I've seen in my line of work uh, each day, you know, that nothing's promised. There's been extraordinary suffering um, the people I've witnessed it myself, you know, in my, in, in the work that I do, you know, people passing away. Uh, I'm pained, um, uh, when I hear that people aren't able to be there with their loved ones to hold their hands or to care for them. And then on the other end, I'm hearing about the joy of giving birth of new life that comes into a family. Um, I'm hearing neighbors, helping neighbors, friends, helping friends. So as much as the world is tilting on the other side, um, there's a part of it too. We have the opportunity to show compassion. Um, and I think if we greet each, each new day with the spirit of gratitude, um, and I find that in my own work, the spirit of gratitude, um, of hope, um, just this belief that, you know, this is human engine that we can all contribute to. I think if we're coming into it that way, Every day is a new day to get it better. As I said in one of the poems I'm going to read later, mm -hmm. each day is a new day to start over, to be, to be able to practice this thing called being human. Mm -hmm. So as devastating as it is, um, just finding the little pieces of joy that you can find. Mm -hmm. well, I, I think we, we see that even in our own neighborhoods where people mm -hmm. are, you know, really mindful of, you know, the needs of other people. Yes. Uh, and I mean, it's it's really a different in a good way. It's a very mm -hmm. different uh, time and where we're yeah. more sensitive to the needs of of other people, maybe people that are shut in. Um, so let's kind of focus on your role as uh, the poet laureate, um, mm -hmm. because in, from the um, interview that you did with HYY mm -hmm. uh, way back when, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there was a, a different, I guess, uh, feeling on your part and energy on your part that, hey, these are the things that I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and first, can you speak to some of them and then speak to, well, some of those things that I had hoped that I was going to be able to do, I cannot do immediately because of, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the plague, as I call it, that we're mm -hmm. facing. Yeah. So, you know, first of all, winning the being selected as the city of Philadelphia Poet Laureate was one of the most exciting things that's happened to me as an individual and as a writer. Um, I still have that, um, you know, that momentum. And is uh, I noticed they're saying Trapita Wilson, Trapita Mason um, mm -hmm. um, on the screen. But okay. um, yeah, so I know we'll change that. But I... I <laughs> So it's Mason. Wilson is that other poet lawyer. 
<laughs> I'm teasing. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, no, I still have the momentum. I will have to, I will say, you know, um, a lot of people have come up to me and said, boy, it's been a tough year. You know, we, you had the Poet Laureate, all this momentum and excitement, and then we have a pandemic, you know, and then on top mm. of that, we have uprisings, which we've always had, but this is like mm. a, a different level. Um, I still have that momentum. Um, mm -hmm. My project very much deals with, you know, mental health. And my project is focused on using poetry as a way to elevate the voices of um, individuals on all level, workers, as well as people, you know, that are, have lived experiences of mental health, but also to raise awareness. Um, so that is something I'm still very committed to. The Poet Laureate tenure is two years. Right. Um, my project had threefold to it. Um, it's called Healing Verse Philly, and it's still very much active. I have the support of the Poet Laureate Committee. Um, and so we've been putting, I mean, I originally was going to launch it in May. So it's just a couple months ago. Um, so the first part of the project um, will be launched in September. Um, so that's like in the, just in the fall. And mm -hmm. it's very, um, it's a project that doesn't involve uh, the first part of it anyway. It, it won't involve um, having to have a lot of gatherings and large gatherings. Uh -huh. um, so a lot of it can be done in a really unique way. In fact, it involves a good old phone line. So you'll mm -hmm. be hearing more about that. And then other parts of it is workshops. Um, it's a, it was a public art installation also. So I have a good um, two, you know, a year and a half to be able to realize this. Um, so I'm very much committed to that. But even though that's like my specific project, but I've also been quite involved in other things. We're working on a, a video project called Unity and um, Descent, Descent and Unity with uh, the Youth Poet Laureate, um, Mia Concepcion and oh. some other former uh, poet laureates and, and other poets. Um, I've engaged in panels, I've engaged in readings. Um, so I've been fairly active um, in recent months, um, but the project is more than the Poet Laureate project to me. It is something that I want to work on and I really want to put a stamp on. How can we use poetry in this platform to talk about mental health, to talk about healing and wellness? Um, so that is something that's going to happen. So I'm, I'm not discouraged. Uh, like everyone else, I think we are grieving, you know, just just grieving, <laughs> you know. But then on the other end, I am, um, I'm not discouraged. I am encouraged and we'll be working on those projects. Will you have a special focus on young people and, you know, uh, as far as, you know, raising the, the opportunities uh, for participation of young people? Because... Uh, this, you know, this is just an observation. Sometimes they're kind of marginalized. I mean, they're on their way up, but they need that platform, that first yes. step uh, to be able to say, this is, this is, I want to be heard. And I'm wondering if that is part of your agenda. Yes, very much so. Everything that I do, I mean, even in my career, the first half of my career was working in children's services. Mm -hmm. um, also, I've been a teaching artist. That's something that uh, even when I wrote for the Poet Laureate application, that is very important to me. You know, I've been a teaching artist for as long as, as for most, for the most part, for as long as I've been writing poetry. Uh, I've worked with everyone from preschool all the way up to college and also um, institutions, prisons, shelters. So this is, I consider myself very much ingrained in the real experiences of everyday people. Mm -hmm. And youth are a big part of that. Their voices must be heard. And also a lot of young people are struggling with things like, you know, depression, anxiety. And, you know, often our young people aren't really talking to us much right now. They're buried mm -hmm. in the computer. They're trying to get through schoolwork and, and everything else, um, but through poetry, their voices come alive, you know, through writing. Right. And um, so they will be very involved. And as I said, I'm really happy that I've got to do this project on the Descent and Unity that will be coming out soon um, with, the, with the Youth Poet Laureate. Yeah. And Philadelphia is, a, you know, a city of neighborhoods, but it's also a city of neighborhoods in, in, a, in a sense of poetry too. 
We have yes. so many communities, different communities, mm -hmm. and you know some of those communities already have. But how do we? How do you intend to reach down into? I mean, it's a very big task when you think of reaching down yeah. to the community mm -hmm. and really uh, opening up an, a, an avenue for people that, let's say, their thing is in poetry, mm -hmm. but you know maybe with the involvement in what you're talking about, that yes. becomes an that becomes a do, new dimension in their life. Yeah, so that's the thing, um, you, you know, and I think maybe this was this is what appealed to me about the poet laureate uh, opportunity, um, and why I was happy to be selected. I'm not really coming at this. I am very much a poet. I'm very much a person who believes in the craft mm -hmm. of the poetry and the work of what you know what poetry can do, and taking the time to learn and to practice. But also, there's a part of me that I've taught so many people that. Sometimes I enter into this and people will say to me, I'm not a poet, I'm not a writer, I don't want to have anything to do with that. It's this high art and they yeah. don't want to be bothered. Yeah. And by the time we are done with just them expressing themselves, mm -hmm. um, meeting people where they are and, and just letting them express themselves, um, they will find, they enter freely. So I've never had a problem as a teaching artist engaging people. I've engaged people in beauty salons and bars <laughs> and, you know, so for me, that's not an issue. The challenge mm -hmm. now is everything is virtual, right? Yeah, right. Um, so perhaps 2021 will be kinder to us <laughs> and then I can do a lot of my footwork. Um, but I do also plan to partner with um, community-based organizations and institutions uh, community centers, uh, you know, whether it's um, community mental health centers, um, often in those places, they're embedded in the communities and mm -hmm. they have their hand on the pulse of the individuals. I'm only one person. So working with other writers, um, uh, developing a cohort of people that can go out there and do this work, it all sounds very ambitious, but you know, a lot of this work I'm doing already is just, you know, um, naming it. Mm -hmm and being able to put some more power and momentum behind it. Yeah, so, and I, and I go across so many yeah. communities, Charles. So mm -hmm. I, I've, you know, I, I, I just enter, you know, those not just African-American, not just African, not just a woman, not just an immigrant, but right. all different communities. Mm -hmm. now, that's wonderful. Yeah, you're also unique in, as an artist, because you're also a musician. And, uh, and you know, I I had you as a guest with Monette uh, mm -hmm. oh, a couple of years ago. It was just a wonderful, wonderful show. Is it's that you know, is that still very much part of your repertoire and you know what you're doing and how you bring music to the community as a part of your poetry? Yeah, I would say the 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 musician part is all on the phenomenal acclaimed Miss Monette Sutler. <laughs> uh -huh. She is the person that, you know, is, you know, there, there's two of us working on this. We did do a, a second CD, as you are aware. Um, this is how we get through and it's still mm -hmm. available. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something that we, that we were, that we released and, and got out there. Um, but no, working with Monette, it's, it's really an equal partnership. Sometimes, you know, poets ask, how do you collaborate with musicians? Um, I kind of stay in my lane because I'm not an arranger and a composer uh -huh. and all of that. But the words, the poems, you know, they complement the music and the music complements the poetry. And I look at that collaboration as a very special collaboration because each of us or e both of us are bringing um, our art to the table and then we're creating um, music. You know, so I've, I've never really seen myself as that musician person. I saw myself very much as a poet who willingly, um, you know, and enthusiastically collaborates with this phenomenal musician that mm -hmm. then we can create something that people can get something out of. Right. The other, the other question I wanted to ask is, uh, yes, you're our Philadelphia mm -hmm. poet, but you're also your background is in Africa and, and Liberia. Yes. Mm -hmm. How much does that, you know, inform you? And what kind of connection do you you 
I mean, have to that uh, on an ongoing basis. Yeah, it informs just about everything that I do. Um, mm -hmm. I am connected to it in the real sense. I have family, you know, in Liberia that I talk to, if not on a daily basis, I would say several times a week. Mm -hmm. I have been back to Liberia um, frequently and I plan to go back. We have family there and interest in different things there. Um, the experience of being a Liberian, uh, everything from the culture to the foundation, to the food, to family, it's all very much a part of me. It's all mm -hmm. a part of what makes me who I am. Mm -hmm. um, but I add that to my other experiences of being this young, you know, black kid that grow, grew up in North Philadelphia, which is also an experience that defined me and it's very much a part of me um, and very much ingrained in who I am. And then you know, this individual that's very much a part of this society. I really consider myself uniquely blessed to be a part of all of these different communities. I do claim my um, Liberian culture. Um, Liberian, you know, if you kind of look at history, there's a lot of connection with the American sure. history. But the piece that resonates the most with me is that there's, the, there's also a, the thing about the struggle, you know, it's a country that is now either the third or the second or whatever on the list of world struggling countries. But the beauty of the people, the art, the art making, um, also um, just the fact that the survival, the thriving out of, mm -hmm. out of everything to still be here. I, you sh I share that with my experience as an African-American in America, as a, as a immigrant, as a Liberian, all of those are interconnected. Mm -hmm. so I'm never without the other, you know, I, I wear so many skins, you know, um, they're all a part of wh who I am. And, and I consider myself blessed to have all those experiences. But there has been also a dual struggle, hasn't there? And the fact there that has you, been. you yeah. are, yes, you are a, a woman of color, but you're also African. And because I, I read a, a little piece of a poem about you and your brother mm -hmm. when you were younger, you know, mm -hmm. having to face some of that um, you know, really uh, push back, you know, yes. about you uh, mm -hmm. being from Africa. And we assume, we make certain assumptions about that, mm -hmm. in, that in the community, which really do jive with reality. Can you just speak a little to that? To yeah, that so, yeah, so it's not all rosy, obviously, mm -hmm. um, you know, in anybody's immigrant experience or anyone's struggle, um, it's not, it's not rosy. So, um, you know, we, we exist, unfortunately, in a time when there is a lot of dividing and conquering, right? Mm -hmm. So coming to this country, being new to America, and being in a community that, you know, where there was tension, you know, there's tension in a sense of you're one of us, because obviously, when you look at me, yes, I'm a black person, I'm right. living in America, but you're not really one of us. Uh -huh. And really, for me, I chose to look at that tension as I chose not to feed into that tension. Because when you go over in certain parts of the continent of Africa and, um, you know, all these different countries are in Africa, you're taught certain things about African-Americans in America. And then um, the American African-Americans are taught things about um, uh, Africans. So now that we can all pretty much you know, we are reading and we can do research and we can Google and we uh -huh. can understand um, some of the manipulative behaviors, you know, manipulative information and propaganda. We, 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 we learn this stuff and we know that you're my brother, you're my sister. I'm not going to fight you because I'm from this continent or that continent. Uh -huh. And what's encouraging is I'm finding a lot more of that that we are, we are one and we really have to resist the dividing and the conquering as mm -hmm. human beings, as, as individuals, as African, African-American, all of that. So this is where I choose to exist in that place where yes, there's hurt and there's wounds, but um, I'm, I'm not really here for that. I'm here for uh, how do we grow, right? right. That's what, thank you. Yeah. So of course we, we want the, switch gears here and we want yeah. to listen to your poems <laughs> that was some poetry. Uh, and, and, as a as a lead-in and mm -hmm. i don't want to steal your thunder but i read a, a, a poem of yours that was on uh, the apiary site mm -hmm. and calling letter to my sister but 
the ending of that is just so uh, stunning and remarkable. And I'll, I'll just quote it. And I just wanted to ask you to respond to it you know, okay. and read the poem. But it's a, and it's a, it says, D, I have managed to poem all my pain. Tell me, what do you do with yours? Mm. Um, so I just mm. use that as a lead into. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I take it you want me to read it, Charles. <laughs> sure, it's a, it's a wonderful poem. <laughs> thank you, and thank you, thank you. Um, yes, it's a it's a little bit of an older uh, piece, um, but it's called Letter to My Sister, and I am really uh, happy to share um, this poem. I have turned our childhood into a few dozen verses. There are places for dramatic pause, and where memory failed, I embellished a bit. You've grown impatient with me in my so-called poetic license. I don't remember that has become your wary mantra. D, I am learning to excavate the good times too. Can't you see where I've colored some words and inserted those tender moments? A famous writer once said that eventually I will tire of myself and will be compelled to tell the eyeless stories. I anxiously await that moment. But for now, I want to tell them about our war with mama's illness and how at school we were maimed for being foreign. Remember D, when they chased us up Tioga Street and accused us of having voodoo and scanned our dark bodies for tribal scars and discovered the cayenne peppers we had hidden to throw in their faces, to sting them, to make them fear us to be left alone, to be African. D, I have managed to poem all of my pain. Tell me, what do you do with yours? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm. So you can continue on with your, you know, we just wanna hear you read your poems. <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna share, I'm gonna jump around and I'm gonna just cool. share a couple Great. of pieces. And some are, I'm gonna share two that are really pretty new and they're like little snippets. Um, um, I wrote this, uh, someone asked me to write sort of a blessing, a gift um, to some people that have been really working hard. And um, I call it in this season. In this season of naming and of holding space for the quieted and the muted to be amplified in this season of shifting, of barrier breaking, of undoing, unearthing, uprising, leveling, you, beloved, may think yourself too small, may think your intentions and acts too slight, may think you are but a fragment, a mere atom in this place of stars and gazers. Well, what a world you are. What a sphere of shocking beauty and grace. Do you not see how your one song, one breath, one step, one voice, your one pause, one lift, one shout, one protest brought us here and keeps us here? You say it's only a speck you offer, a tiny bit, a morsel, but do you not see the feast ahead it prepares, how even the remains have purpose, how it beckons all to your grand table, how it feeds and fills and expands. Friend, you are a bomb in these prickly times. You are a vessel of refuge, a respite. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to go back and forth. So I'm going to read. Uh, I feel like really reading a lot of women pieces today. Great. You know, I, I feel like um, we're in that state and that stage. I know an announcement was made today about the running mate and all of that. And I'm just kind of in this spirit. Um, I'm, I'm just going to just share a couple of little pieces. So this one is called Send Off. Daughters. Our country for all its promise tends to eat its young. If you remain here, some round belly man will mince you, will clean his teeth with your course. Look how they roam the villages to claim their bedmates, how they yank one daughter and then another, waving their small prey like bush meat. See how they pluck them right off the road and out of the school halls even before they ripen. 
See how they beckon the college ones lining the streets, flag them down, usher them into SUVs for hair weave, high heels, or school fee. You are going to America now. Forget who you were and think only of who the visa you hold says you are. Your entrance in that place is a gift. It is a present many of us can't even hope to open. Live quiet there. Make something useful of yourself and for all of our daughters to follow. Be something more than breast and butt and taunt stomach for gluttonous men to rest their woolly heads. Daughters, we send you off. Hearts heavy like pregnant gut, like swollen plums. We have sown our wishes in the seams of your flesh. Your skin will grow so tough that jaw bones will break when they try to gnaw. You are our map. And when you return, we will study you. For now, we send you off, clutching our country cloth. Our mouths follow you, daughters, lovingly arc in oval pleas of go, go, go. On Sunday, they will come. And this is from a headline about an, from the Philadelphia Inquirer, and it said, Immigration raid likely starting Sunday. There's a girl swallowing cold cereal and reading the news to her father. He hovers over her, watching her slim fingers scroll up the screen. He is waiting for reassurance, something to say, not to worry. She has delivered this message before. A simple scan of an article, a dismissive shrug, then, Daddy, it's okay. This morning, the headline is clear. On Sunday, they are coming. Will it be before or after mass, she wonders? Should they avoid the market? Should they play checkers first? Should mommy cook all of the week's meal, like her usual routine, or leave it since they are coming on Sunday? Once, she had to explain the word raid to her father. She tried a dictionary definition first, raid a sudden attack on an enemy, an onslaught, an assault. And finally, she said, raid is when they come into your home and stop every progress you've been making. They come in numbers and they break through your life like a hurricane, a storm. They make you dash all that you've become. The girl focuses on the word likely, immigration raid, likely Sunday. She tells her father, it's a harmless word, meaning might or maybe not today. It buys time. Her father breathes. She swallows her cornflakes. And this is a poem that I wrote um, um, for the at the beginning of the pandemic. It's called "We Will Make Something Out of This Too." We are the builders, the creators, and the magicians of our lives. We are the designers and the inventors of our lives. And we will make something out of this too. We strain to understand this new language in our grave and wary lilt, in our haggard cadence. We mouth to one another stark words, distancing, isolation, loss, emptiness. Someone will ask us if we're going to be all right. and We would tell them only if we believe it. Another will ask us if we're going to get through this and we would tell them that we will have to want it bad enough to see it. We strain to manage this new way of learning ourselves. The day before the world tilted, I claimed to be a lover of humankind. I touted my goodwill and arrogance about, bared my self-righteousness and feel-goods across my chest. And then when the world placed us in timeout, I had to prove it. I had to check, take only my ration from the market, check on neighbors and phone friends, press my palms against the glass to see family, my hellos and goodbyes muted, my farewells and home goings silenced. I walk these streets, I know, like a stranger, like a soul outside of myself. Hold my lone woman praise and worship. Be okay with passing through the same four rooms while Mahalia blanks me in song. 
how I got over. I've been falling and rising all of these years, but you know, my soul sits back and wonder, how did we make it over? I know that we are builders, designers, and architects of our lives. We can draft an existence one day when it's upended, erase, maintain the foundation, and start over the next. We are all in our dojo of life, and this world has become our sensei, and we are stealth students studying this new language, this new thing, meditating and marveling, marinating and musing, moving and mourning. Each day, another chance to practice being human. Each day, another chance to learn to master ourselves. Wow, that is very inspiring, Paul. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, a lot of people should read that. It's really, <laughs> a very beautiful poem. I wanted to Thank ask you, you're, you're, a, you're a very busy person, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. two questions I really, is, what is your discipline for, for writing poetry? Mm. Uh, do you have a, a specific time that you set aside during the week or during the day? Uh, or is it really more driven by, this is what I'm observing in the world and I need to write about it? It's a little bit of both. Um, I've had to become very disciplined as of late because the time, it, time is a factor. Um, I have my full-time job. I'm a full-time artist, and there are many projects that I'm participating in. I'm teaching a class um, at for Rosenbach. I will be teaching a class at Drexel with uh, wonderful Yolanda Wisher. Um, I'm also involved in a number of other projects. So I have been very intentional about putting time aside. Uh, I'm For me, it happens best early in the morning. So uh, I'm trying to do that at least three to four days a week. Uh, which means I would have to get up super early, which, mm -hmm. <laughs> which isn't that much of a problem. But being able to spare at least an hour or so, um, I'm being, I, I have my office here. So I'm, I try to really make that a useful space. I surround it with things that inspire me. And then also there are times when the urgent poems and stories have to come and I could be at work. And so in my head, I'm, I'm like, memorizing the first couple lines in my head, I'm saying it over and over again. Mm -hmm. And then I hope that I don't get to the point where by the time I get home, I forget it. Or if I can, I, I hurry up and put it on the phone. Um, for someone who has been very much into paper and pen, I have a million journals and I love pens and I love journals. Um, I've become very okay with using uh, my phone and an app called Pages. And it's helped me a lot where I can um, write, right into my phone. I can't really read from my phone that well because I'm glasses and all of that, but mm -hmm. to be able to write into it and edit and go back over and over again, that's been helpful. So all those things uh, I've put into somewhat of a, of a ritual. It is a challenge though. I mean, when you're living the kind of life that you're living that yeah. you have that observation, you have those words, uh, and sometimes it's uh, perhaps when you're just going to bed and you, it flicks yes. on, but you don't have a pen or anything next to you. Yeah. And you'll say, when I get up in the morning, it'll be there. Uh, there are a lot of times don't do that. <laughs> so don't do that. Is, yeah, I've done really that. Important, important to do that. The other thing is that, um, just a, a question, who would you say, I mean, as far as other poets, um, have really had an influence on your work? Wow. Oh boy. You're about to give me, uh, there's a list. Uh -huh. So, um, uh, Lucille, everybody that knows me knows that, you know, Lucille Clifton, uh, Sonia Sanchez, I'm very much, uh, Luc I, I say Lucille Clifton because there's so much of her life. Um, there's a part of her life I, that, um, I'm, I'm intrigued by her entire life, but, um, there's a thing about, her always kind of being, not always, but initially as a writer, underestimated and how powerful her slim lines are. If you know, if you're familiar with mm -hmm. Steele Clifton's work, mm -hmm. her lines are small for the most part, her word, her poems, but they're so powerful. And even in her life, 
it seems like as a writer, she wasn't the, the loudest writer, so to speak, or the most flamboyant writer, but she was extremely powerful. And there's something in her story that, 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 that kind of keeps me going. Sonia Sanchez, um, the, the courage, the, 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 the courageousness to be able to speak her truth. Um, that's something that's powerful to me. And I also like writers like, I love, uh, uh, Marie Howe. I like how she writes the family stories. Um, uh, um, um, of course, Pablo Neruda, I, I love. Um, I could go on and on. Yeah. There are poets that I, I love to read that in, inspire me. Um, I'm an avid reader. Um, mm -hmm. uh, some poets I would pick up, um, that I am not familiar with and I would read. Also my contemporaries, um, I am amazed by people like Yolanda Wisher, people like, um, you know, the writers out here, the, the younger poets also, Kerwin, these different people that are doing amazing things. Um, Ursula, she kind of, you know, she's taken into a different level in terms of poetry and music, uh, and Zadi. Um, there, are, there are a number of writers that I'm influenced by. Mm -hmm. Now you, we have this the, the youth poet laureate, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. And what is her relationship to you? Or are you? I mean, is it a, a role where you mentor her in a way uh, in this role? Is that is that the the way you have been working uh, with her, or how does that work over time? Well, it's it's been a unique time, as we're saying right now. The the, the intent of the poet laureate uh, and the youth poet laureate is to have it can take on many forms, whether it's collaborative, it's a partnership, it's an you know to encourage, um, to mentor, all of those things. Uh, I haven't had the there are a couple of uh, opportunities that Mia and I had to work together that unfortunately were canceled due to COVID. But mm -hmm. we have been communicating, you know, the Youth Poet Laureate tenure is one year. Right. And so we have been communicating. And as I said, I'm so happy that we are collaborating on this particular project. Mm -hmm. um, because she also, um, Mia also, excuse me, uh, had to adjust um, to that schedule of, you know, going from, she's, just, you know, um, they are a senior in school and being able to go from you know going to class every day to then doing it online and then also you know so that adjustment is there and then to be graduating so mm. the, the the youth poet and the adult poet laureate relationship can take on different form i'm very happy to say that we have been able to build um a good relationship with the youth poet laureate and right now we're in the process of you know looking for the next youth poet laureate and I think I would have a, probably a longer time and we would be hopefully beyond the emergency part of COVID mm -hmm. um, to be able to have a lot more, you know, connection as I would like. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there, there's a lot of opportunity that exists for those roles and um, each, each poet laureates can kind of work that out together. Yeah, before the clock runs out, I hope to have uh, on uh, the Philly Loves Poetry because I think it would be yeah. Great experience for our audience to listen to her, listen to her poetry, mm -hmm. listen to her perspective. Once again, I, I I love that opportunity to have young people and the voice of young people on this uh, program. That's so important. Yes. So can can we turn back to uh, some poems from you? Oh yeah, we can always sure. turn back to poems. <laughs> <laughs> poems are here. Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, share a, another very short poem that's kind of new. Um, and uh, uh, as I say, Yolanda and I were teaching this class for the Rosenbach and it's um, Black Women Writers and it's like short story. And we are teaching all, along with a number of other people, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. And so I was really happy to be introduced to some part of her work that I wasn't familiar with. And she has a speech called, We Are All Bound Up Together. So I wrote a brief poem where I took a line from, four lines from her speech and just created a little poem. Um, and it goes like this. I speak of wrongs even when I stand still, voice muffled, makes no difference how flamboyant my rage, how elegant the arc of my middle finger, 
how urge in my stop killing us seeps through clenched teeth. I'm rendered invisible, a mirage, a small thing. I felt the fight in me, but I don't want to have to fight all the time. Sometimes I ache for lemon tea, honeyed and ice and green space sprawling in a spread before me, my head cushioned by a lover's lap. I don't want to fight today, fatigued, battle worn, but my hand against every man and every man's hands against me is what I've gotten instead. So I've learned to knuckle up, to strap and scrap, to word box, shadow box, burst out of being boxed in. I scream murder to all within earshot. I wring my tears and blood and sweat all over you. I wring my hands and I reach for you. We are all bound up together. The same chains you've latched on me, I now loose on you. Mm. And in that vein of the back in the day, I'm gonna share a piece called um, Happy Birthday Dinah. This is another project that I'm working on um, with this uh, historical figure named Dinah from Stenton. And I am creating somewhat a, a play with poems about the life of Dinah. Uh, late 1720s, happy birthday, Dinah. Two of us waited by your mother's thighs, rubbed her belly and felt her walls grip and release. One of us parted her legs wide like a road opening and stood right dead in the center of her and peered into her dark tunnel and saw your crowning. We set ourselves in that leaning shack. We grounded ourselves to catch you. A small ball of slick and slippery brownness you were. A thumping mass of hair and birthing scars you were. Don't let anyone tell you you have no born date. We were there. We witnessed you arriving. You came out calm like a river in June. Your mama yelped and cooed. We warmed our palms before we held you. Your mama would not let you go. She should have been born in another time. I didn't know how to let, she didn't know how to let go of you. We encircled her and chanted away her sorrow. We three sisters warned, steal away, steal away, steal away home. She ain't got long to stay here. You were born before the sun tipped his hat. It was a Saturday and we wore white. Your mama's lips quivered when she asked if you were a boy or a girl. A question vibrated that room, unsteadying us. A boy will be seasoned into a workhorse. The girl will be bred soon. She start to breed, to bleed. She's a girl, we told her. She's a girl and something in her broke. We call that thing love, Dinah. It's black love. And sometimes it looks like an easing river. Sometimes it's a tight ball of blood and wounds. You have people, Dinah. We waited near your mother's thighs. We held her feet in her hands. We warmed our palms before we caught you. And later when you sprung up a wee bit and they came to snatch you from us, we held our palms to our wet cheeks and felt your warmth fleeing. And to your weeping willow of a mama, we chanted our love song. We three sisters soothed, steal away, steal away, Still away home. She ain't had long to stay here. Wow. All right. Can you take us yeah. out with just one more? Yes, I can. Um, that was an extraordinary and I, poem. Thank you, Charles. I, I like want to, to tell uh, you thank I, I, you. <laughs> I would like to know more about, you know, Dinah. I mean, we're not now, but, you know, it's, it's really going to pique my Yes, you will know more about Dinah because um, it's going to be a, a, a whole event <laughs> that okay. Dinah is going to be. So I'm going to end with a poem. Um, I've been reading all about the women and the girls. Um, I'm going to just share a poem called uh, Our Brother, um, Holiday 1980s. And it's a memory of my brother who passed in 2012. One hand drags a six foot pine, the other a frozen grip on a fragile paper bag, housing 21 pounds of turkey, canned gravy, cranberries and potatoes. He is our Hansel, trekking through the fresh snow, littering 12 blocks with needles and twigs. Daddy's pride would have starved us back then, but what guts, what grit one needs to seek 
and ask to rummage for kindness among strangers. At that late hour, our brother accepts the half-thawed bird from Holy Soul's food cupboard and never reveal to them our shame, our cold and mocking oven shut off by PGW, our improvisation with poverty, crock pot, kerosene heater, two hot plates, our bath water maker, body warmer, food cooker. Our brother is a wonder, a damp and scrawny hero he is, jollier than Saint Nick, 15-year-old wise man, holy harbinger, concealing a pack of cigarettes, whistling into the desolate night, a small bronze star in North Philly, bringing us Christmas. Oh, absolutely beautiful. Thank so you. I wanted, to, I wanted to really thank you so much for letting us have the opportunity to talk about your role as Poet Laureate, and of course, to listen mm -hmm. to your, your wonderful, amazing poetry. And I think we're in good hands here in Philadelphia now. <laughs> you as our representative uh, for uh, Poet Laureate. And so I, it's, you know, we're looking forward to more of it and to, you know, participating in your events, know more about it. You know, you must always feel you have a home at Moonstone. <laughs> Uh, of arts. course, yes. And, uh, you know, you, you have a home here at Philly Loves Poetry. Uh, if there's something, you know, that you would, you know, uh, uh, an idea that you want to, to present, we would love to, you know, have you back on again. Um, yeah. But it's really been, uh, it's really been a treat. I really appreciate it. And uh, it, it, this is really wonderful. And I, I wish you all the success, you know, in, in this, uh, in this endeavor, especially the fact that you are facing a challenge in being able to do that, but you seem to have the the spirit to go forward with it, and yeah. I know you will succeed. You are a very positive person, so uh, I'm very glad to have you on, on this program. Well, so, thank you. I just want to tell you thank you, Larry, Moonstone, Sergio, and uh, Philly yeah. Cam. You uh, and Moonstone and Philly Cam provide a platform for us artists to get our voices and our words out there. And I wanna thank you for this opportunity. Um, Philly, I'm gonna do you proud as a poet laureate. We have a slow pandemic start, <laughs> <laughs> but we're gonna make this happen. Oh, and I'm gonna reach absolutely. every corner and crevice of this great city with poetry. So thank you for this opportunity. Great. Well, I, I just wanted to say, when we talk about the Moonstone Art Center, Moonstone, a lot of people don't know that Moonstone actually uh, operates a preschool and has for 32 years at 11th and Catherine. And uh, our preschool was actually founded in, uh, by Larry and his, his wife, Sandy. But the focus wow. of the whole program is an arts-based program, very exciting mm -hmm. program. Uh, this weekend, we're going to have uh, a uh, remote auction, uh, you know, to continue to raise funds for our uh, Moonstone Preschool because we use the money uh, for scholarships for people uh, uh -huh. that might have a challenge to be able to afford, you know, our tuition. So um, if people want to go to the Moonstone Preschool site and find out how they could participate in the auction, it begins on the 16th, mm -hmm. uh, but I imagine it's going to be ongoing. Also, uh, the Moonstone Arts Center, always need support. I mean, I think a lot of people take for granted that Larry's been doing these things all all these years. Yes, uh, But yes. there is a cost and there's the need uh, for support. So if you want to provide that kind of support, people can go to the Moonstone Arts Center, uh, you know, dot org and find out how you can be a participant or even find out more about what the, the Art Center is doing, what their agenda is. And we're still, you know, we're still doing uh, events even during this pandemic. So uh, I want to again appreciate that. I appreciate also the staff at um, Philly Cam that makes this uh, so flawless and so easy to do. Yes. Sergio, you know, he's, <laughs> yes, Sergio, he's a magician, thank you. <laughs> and Laura, uh, they're really terrific. So thank you again. And uh, I hope to see you again next month. Thank mm -hmm. you.